So thank you for talking to uh, to me, um, to Justice, uh, to Judge, sorry, uh, Preston. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the Land and Environment Court and what that is. Uh, the Land and Environment Court is a specialised court. Uh, which was established about 30 years ago in New South Wales, which is one of the states or provinces of Australia. And it has a very wide jurisdiction to deal with all sorts of environmental uh, matters and resource matters. Um, it's uh, an interesting mix between a superior court, like a Supreme Court, and an administrative tribunal. So uh, to that end, it has both judges, uh, who are Supreme Court judges, as well as commissioners who are specialists in fields relevant to environmental law. So uh, planners, architects, engineers, scientists, uh, hydrologists, all of those different disciplines. So they can bring their expertise to bear in resolving environmental disputes. And um, how many, how widespread is this? How many cases do you hear? And, and... Well, the court um, workloads and varies depending upon what uh, legislation is uh, in force over the years, but currently we're uh, close to 2,000 cases would go through the court a year um, across all the different ranges of matters. Well, what type of matters? Well, we have um, in our sort of administrative tribunal functions, we have many sort of uh, appeals against uh, local government or state government uh, decisions to approve developments, factories, marinas, uh, any types of development. Uh, any pollution cases, uh, dealing with giving licenses for, for various uh, industry, uh, resource permits, uh, the given water um, allocations. Um, we also get uh, cases to deal with uh, native title, so Aboriginal uh, land claims. Um, we have roles as far as compulsory acquisition of land, uh, the compensation that's there, valuation of land. Uh, other real property or land issues come through there. So that's our sort of administrative tribunal role. Then we also have uh, all sorts of enforcement envi of environmental law, so both civilly, uh, so where people bring proceedings to uh, remedy restrain breaches of environmental laws, um, and judicial review, so where they're challenging uh, government action to approve development uh, or otherwise make decisions that may have environmental impact, they can challenge those decisions. Then there's the criminal enforcement, so prosecutions are brought uh, before the court. The court has a very wide range of powers in relation to applicants and people to prison. Uh, we can uh, fine them uh, up to $7 million. Um, and uh, there's also many other uh, orders for rehabilitation of land and reinstatement of um, you know, compensation for damages and losses. So why would you, why would someone create an environment, land and environment court instead of using an environmental tribunal or for that matter the courts, the regular courts? The problem with picking either just a tribunal or a court is that you can't get all of the jurisdiction in one place. So if you just took the say a tribunal then yes you can deal with the administrative appeals that tribunals typically deal with and there are many in um, the provinces uh, of Canada. But then they wouldn't get the uh, equitable jurisdiction, the administrative law or public law jurisdiction uh, from a superior court or the criminal jurisdiction that comes from the provincial courts. Um, well, why, so, is that important? why is it important to have all house Because then um, you have, look at one dispute, all its aspects. So there, it doesn't mean that you have to shop around between different uh, tribunals and courts. That increases, obviously, the, the costs to the parties. Uh, it also can mean that you get inconsistent decision making. Uh, so that in the one dispute, you can have a different fact finding, uh, different sort of outcomes, which is uh, not satisfactory uh, for environmental matters. The other aspect about bringing together is that you do get um, expertise developed and you're better able to deal with environmental disputes because you're attuned to the particular aspects of environmental uh, disputes. Uh, if you're a, an ordinary generalist court who deals with only a few matters a year and dissipated amongst different judges, you can never actually truly understand environmental disputes and come understand you know, all the different principles and 
issues that arise, the characteristics of those disputes. So it, it does assist in uh, bringing together in all one place. Mm -hmm. I know you've developed some interesting uh, procedures to make sure that the public has access to your court. Can you tell us a bit about those? And that was an important part. The you know access to justice is absolutely critical. There, there may be these rights um, given by statutes to come to the court in relation to agricultural matters, but if the court doesn't set up the procedures uh, and have practice and information uh, which makes those rights real, then they just remain theoretical. So that was a very important part of the court's um, uh, reason for its existence, and we take it seriously. So we try to make sure that we have uh, information available. Uh, it's all written in plain English. It's available on our website. Uh, people, any person can, um, who wants to bring proceedings in the court can access that information. It's self-help guides, uh, all uh, available, sort of hyperlinked through to the legislation, to the forms, to the procedures, the questions and answers, uh, the practice notes. Uh, so that makes it easier for firstly to come through. Uh, secondly, we, we've uh, tried to have innovative ways of receiving um, evidence. Uh, we uh, have available the specialist expertise of, through the commissioners who are appointed to the court. That assists uh, so that not everyone has to always hire an expert. They can use the expertise of the court uh, in understanding the issues. Uh, we go to the site of the dispute, so many cases are actually heard on the particular side of the dispute. Field trip. Yeah, a field trip. And uh, some go from beginning to end uh, uh, at the, uh, the site of it. And that means that the uh, average person is able to be there where the, the site of the dispute is. They can point out what their concerns are. They can give evidence in a, an environment that they're comfortable with. Uh, and if, for example, it was a particular view that they're concerned about or a particular trees or other you know, fauna that they're concerned about, they can actually point that out uh, on site. Um, and so we do that um, at hours that also are convenient to people. We start early and we'll work late uh, to take that evidence. So that assists in uh, doing that, but it also means that if there needs to be any experimentation with the experts, they can do that on the site. Uh, we can um, carry out um, investigations on the site, and that can be done with the experts jointly. Uh, when we have experts from parties, we also use what we call joint conferencing and concurrent evidence, and that means the experts from each party have to get together, they have to discuss the matters where they are uh, issues, and they have to say where they're in agreement, where they're in disagreement, uh, and then produce a joint report. Now that joint report is to the court and not to the parties. Uh, so their obligation is set out in the um, procedures of the court that their primary obligation is to the court and not to the individual parties and they must disclose that in any evidence that they give. And then that joint report then forms the basis for concurrent evidence. Uh, some people refer to it as hot tubbing but what it really means is you're putting the experts in the witness box together and then the judge uh, will uh, conduct the, the dialogue on the issues of disagreement. And so you'll get that explanation of the one side expert's point and then immediately the other expert's counterpoint. And there's this dialogue between experts. And that way of uh, investigation uh, really gets to the truth much better and it avoids the extremes of partisan um, experts, the gun for hire. So those are some of the uh, innovations that we've done. We also use technology to have electronic court hearings, uh, telephone court hearings, video conferencing, uh, to try and break down barriers um, for access. What, what portion of the people appearing before you would be self-represented? Uh, it varies on the, the types of matter. Um, obviously, if it's a criminal matter, they might tend to have more lawyers involved, um, but if it's a, a matters like tree disputes, it will be 80% of uh, both parties will be represented by themselves. Um, so uh, smaller development appeals, again a higher representation of uh, self-represented litigants, uh, large developments worth many millions of dollars, corporations are involved in it, they tend to get lawyers involved. So it will vary depending upon the nature of the matter. So to sum up, <coughs> To sum up, then, what would you say is the best thing about having a land and environment court? 
I think that by having this sort of one-stop shop where you could have the Rhyme and Court and having that special specialisation, the expertise there, you can uh, better understand environmental disputes, better resolve them, uh, we do it quicker, but also we are able to develop environmental uh, jurisprudence. We're able to understand the principles and so that the body of environmental law is uh, developed and has progressed uh, over time. And that's an important contribution that the court makes uh, so that it's uh, fleshing out the, ske the skeleton that the, the legislature uh, has uh, passed uh, by explaining how those laws can be applied in practice. Well, thank you very much for, for talking to us about the uh, Land and Environment Court. It was a pleasure. Thank you.